word of God. I believe every word of God is true. Because it's impossible for God to lie. Amen. So we thank the Lord for that. All right, Acts chapter 23. And actually the last verse, we'll be looking at the last verse of 22. Uh, remember, the chapters and the verses, divisions weren't inspired. They were put there much later in history. They were put there so it would be easier for us to find places in the Scripture. Uh, think of how difficult it must have been in the days of Christ when what they had to do was open a scroll and try to find the spot that they were looking for. You know, without having these chapter verses and uh, chapter divisions and verse divisions. And so the only problem is they're not, they're not perfect. And sometimes they start or end sooner than they should. So verse 30 should actually be a part of chapter 23. And uh, if you have a Rory Study Bible, I believe Rory Study Bible points that out in the way that it, it, it frames its, its, the contents. It, it frames it for you. It gives you like an outline. The Rory Study Bible does. So does the Schofield Study Bible does the same thing. Uh, but anyway, none of those stuff are inspired. It just helps to help us find places easier. So we've been through the three missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And then despite God's warnings, he, he still feels he needs to go to Jerusalem. Plus, he is bringing relief money. They have collected relief money for the saints at Jerusalem because the saints at Jerusalem are suffering dearly. Uh, despite the fact that thousands were saved early on, not all Israel was saved. The majority of Israel was in unbelief still. So even though you have 5,000 that believed uh, and 3,000 at another time, you still have a great majority that does not believe. And so, um, so anyway, um, they were suffering. They were going through some things. And so Paul had wanted to bring this collection. Therefore, he had other people with him. Um, why? To make sure that the money was delivered the way that it was supposed to. That's just good sense, right? To take care of the business handling being properly. Everybody knows what's going on. And so different men from the different locations went with Paul back to Jerusalem. Okay, now, uh, because they went back with him to Jerusalem, they distribute the money to the apostles. The apostles then would distribute it to uh, the saints that have need there. Now, because these other men were with Paul, when Paul goes into the temple, and remember, Paul went into the temple taking a vow. This was, this was the, the idea of the Christian council there, right? This was their idea. Their idea was, oh, Paul, you know, take this vow and pay for these other guys to get their hair cut that took this vow and just show good faith when you go into the temple so that nobody, because right now everybody has heard so much hearsay about Paul and it's all negative. They all hate him. Now, all the Jews that are Jews hate Paul. Amen. And so he's really uh, in a bad place. The old saying, between a rock and a hard place. So they assume when they see him in the temple and some of these people from overseas locations remember Paul and they see him there and they begin to grab him and to seize him and to make accusations. And one of the accusations was he brought, he brought a Gentile into the temple. No, he didn't. He never brought a Gentile into the temple. Uh, they just assumed that because he was associating with Gentiles that were traveling with him. And they were other believers, amen? They weren't, uh, you know, lost people or anything like that. So anyway, as you already know the account, that's when the whole ruckus breaks out, and then the Roman soldiers have to seize him before he's beaten to death. And then the Roman soldiers want to know what went on, what did you do to cause this uproar, and to get the truth out of Paul, they're going to whip it out of him. So he just got beat by the Jews, now the Gentiles are going to have their turn. But before they can take that whip and bring it across his back, what does Paul say? He says, can you, can you uh, scourge a, a Roman citizen who's not condemned? I'm paraphrasing that. And, uh, of course, the answer is no. You can't just, if you're a Roman citizen, you can't just arbitrarily be scourged if you're not condemned for anything. All right, so now you got the Roman soldiers are nervous because they know that Paul is a Roman citizen. And they asked, well, did you buy your citizenship? And Paul says, no, I was born free. Amen. He was born a Roman citizen. And so, therefore, he has the full rights and protection of Rome at this time. 
So now they want to find out what's going on. So now they're going to call everybody together. So I've got this broken down to three points, Paul's fiery spirit, Paul's strategy, and Paul's future service. And uh, it's only the first 11 verses that we want to look at. But beginning in verse number 30 of chapter 22, the Word of God says there, On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty whereof he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priest and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. All right? So the council is the Sanhedrin council. In fact, that's the title of the message, if you need a title, is Paul before the Sanhedrin. And so he takes the bonds, he takes the chains and everything off of the Apostle Paul, and uh, he has these chief priests and all them to come in. And now they're all set. And once again, the Sanhedrin council was a Jewish council. I believe it was about 70 men, may have been more. I'm not totally sure because I'm going by my memory on that. And they would decide legal matters amongst the Jews. Now, you know, I'm always talking prophecy. Sometimes people get upset with me. I'm, I'm sorry, but I think it's important. In Israel today, since Israel was driven out of their land as a nation, they didn't have a Sanhedrin. But today in Israel, they have a Sanhedrin. Is that, an, is that interesting? Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. Now, the Sanhedrin today doesn't have the power that the Sanhedrin then had. But just the mere fact that they set up a Sanhedrin, they have a Sanhedrin council, that means a lot. Amen? We're getting closer to the second coming of Christ. So here you have the council, and they want to determine what did Paul do. So verse number one says, And Paul earnestly beholding the council. Now don't miss what he's saying there. He earnestly beholding. He intently is looking upon them. It's like a gaze. He's got a gaze on the Sanhedrin council. These are the men, or these are some of the men that are staring up the trouble against him. And, and, and I don't believe it's a look of anger uh, as much as a, a look of maybe disgust. Maybe I, I can't believe that you guys would even treat me this way. It's just contrary to the law, how you're treating me, and, and the law of God, that is. And he has this intent gaze as he gaze at this council. So don't miss that. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. In other words, I'm not guilty of anything. I have lived before God in a good conscience. And Paul says this in other places. I have a good conscience, uh, a clear conscience between God and man. In other words, there's no offense between me and God and no offense between me and man. And by the way, if you have an offense between you and men, then you have an offense between you and God. Because God's told us to forgive everybody unconditionally the way he's forgiven us. And so here, Paul says, I have a, I have a good conscience. Amen. My conscience is not convicting me of anything because I haven't done anything wrong. Amen. And so I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded him that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. In other words, slap him in the face. That's what the high priest, the high priest shouldn't be doing this. This isn't what the high priest does, amen? Uh, in fact, Paul's going to uh, quote, I think, Exodus where, he, well, he's going to quote Exodus about another matter. But anyway, it, it, it's in the law that, you, you know, you just don't strike a Jew for no reason like this. And so, uh, let's find out a little about, the, about this guy Ananias, because while the name is similar, the people are different. And Ananias was uh, appointed high priest in 47, A.D. 47. And this Ananias was appointed by one of the Herods, and it was all political, and he was a corrupt guy. He was given to greed and to, and to wealth, and he could care less about what was true. He just wanted to have money. In fact, uh, one commentary that I read, uh, he said that... Uh, uh, that this Ananias ruled with a mafia-style rule because that's what the temple had become. This is why Jesus was so upset and he overturned the, t the, the tables in the temple because of the fact that, uh, that it become a mafia. It become a, a business of making, making money. 
And, and so uh, this high priest is, is a long line of these corrupt men that were running and controlling Jerusalem. And so uh, he, he, let, he, he was the high priest for, you know, dozens of years. I don't know exactly how many, but definitely more than 12 or so years he's, he's high priest. Now, uh, an interesting thing about Ananias, this high priest, is when the tensions uh, in between Rome and, uh, and, and the Jews, as, it, as those tensions begin to increase in 60, 66, AD 66, you have a great uproar, and guess who gets killed by his own people? Ananias. Amen? Listen, you don't mess with God's man and not have it come back around and get you. Amen? And Ananias was corrupt and he was evil, and because he sided with Rome on everything, the Jews assassinated him in that uproar in A.D. 66. Pretty interesting. You might be bored by it, but you're looking at a guy who watches the History Channel for crying out loud. <laughs> you, you can't trust the History Channel either, especially when it comes to the Bible, which made me think, if I can't trust it when it comes to the Bible, how can I trust it with other things? But yet I'm so much interested in history, I find myself peeking in there to see what's, see what's on. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm interested with this stuff. So uh, the high priest uh, commanded them that stood by him, the one that stood next to him, to smite him on the mouth. And he does. Verse 3, Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to, to judge me after the law, and condemnest me to be smitten contrary to the law. And so Paul's telling him, how are you sitting in judgment of me and you're doing just the opposite? You're commanded me to be smitten, to be hit in the face, punched in the mouth, which is contrary to the law. So how in the world uh, are you the high priest to judge me? That's what Paul says. Now, he doesn't realize he's talking to the high priest at this time. So anyway... <coughs> Let's look a little closer at Paul's, at Paul's statement. It says in verse 3, Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, that whited wall. Now this is very interesting. Uh, back in uh, Matthew 23, I believe it is, 27, where Paul, or excuse me, where Jesus is, is getting on the religious leaders of Israel, he calls them white-washed white sepulchers. Now, a whited wall is similar to this, but it's slightly different, all right? So a whitewashed sepulcher, what does that mean? Well, prior to uh, <clears throat> Passover, they would whitewash all the sepulchers. And the reason that they would do that was so that nobody would accidentally come upon them and touch them and then become undefiled because you're coming in contact with something that's dead. So under Jewish law and tradition, now you become undefiled. So <clears throat> they don't want that to happen. So they whitewashed all the sepulchers. Jesus said that they were whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. In other words, they look good outward. The appearance of a whitewashed sepulcher looked good outward, but inwardly they were a bunch of dead men. And that was a strong accusation that Jesus had against those Jewish uh, religious leaders. Now Paul says something similar, but it's different. He says white wall. Well, what's the difference? The difference is this, is that they would build a wall, or over time a wall would become weak, and it would become flimsy, and possibly, you know, could, could come down. Well, you might want to sell it or pass it on or whatever. You don't want to take care of it. You, white, you, white, you paint it white. You know, you get a nice, good uh, paint job on there, fresh paint job, so it looks good. But really, the wall isn't stable at all. And so to call somebody white-walled, you're, you're saying, well, yeah, you look good on the outside, but you're, you're not stable, man. You're not stable at all. You're, you're being passed off as something that's good that's not good. Uh, even today, you might see something like that. You might see some shady contractor. He paints a wall. Man, the place looks good. Look at that nice room there. And then you put your hand on the wall, and all of a sudden, it's, it's moving a little bit. Uh, what's going on here, amen? And, and you think that I'm, that I'm you know, making this up. Uh, when I was <clears throat> sitting in infusion, waiting for infusion, they always have this channel on that is the, the people are always doing construction. And the contractor before that, that was working on that house, that he was a shady guy. 
And he did all, he really messed up the place, amen? But he was passing it off as, oh, no, this is good. This is quality work. This is real nice. It wasn't. It was, it was no good. And this is exactly what Paul is saying. You're passing yourself off as something that's good, and you're not. You're unstable. And so this is really a strong accusation that Paul is making against the, uh, the high priest and possibly more than the high priest. All right, so in verse 3 again, Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and condemnest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Verse number 4, And they that stood by said, uh, Revilest thou God's high priest? Do you speak against God's high priest? He's, they're coming back at him. Do you speak against God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not. In other words, I knew not. Uh, <coughs> I knew not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. And that's Exodus 22, 28. All right? So that's what it says in the law. Now, I don't know about you, but that kind of convicted me a little. Right? Because in our nation where we supposedly have freedom of speech and you can give your opinion... That's all right, but sometimes you can be a little vindictive. And I find myself that even though there's people that I don't like that I feel are corrupt and are using the office uh, for their own good, like our president has and is doing, uh, I still need to respect the office. Amen? I remember in the military, they used to say, you don't have to respect the man, but you have to respect the rank. Amen? And you had to do that. And uh, sometimes I think I, I may muddy the waters a little. There's one thing in telling the truth about an issue, and there's another thing where you just, you're so full of, of, of anger and bitterness, you start maligning a person. We don't want to go there. We want to expose the error, yes, no matter who it is. But we do not want to get to the point where we're just dragging people through the mud and maligning their character. Because really, people that do that do that because they don't have an argument. You see that in debates. When they don't have an argument, they start talking about the other person's character. But we don't want to do that. And the Bible tells us, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. And so we need to be careful. I need to be careful of that. All right, now verse number 6, we move into Paul's strategy. And you're going to notice something very interesting here. Paul never says, I'm a Christian. Because if he does that, it's over with, amen? They don't, they don't receive anybody that says they're a Christian. They, first of all, they think Jesus is a renegade rabbi, and every Christian is a defector of the true faith. So if he, call, if he tells them he's a Christian right up front, that's not going to help his case. So he has to come up with another method, with something else. So there's a rift that he's going to use, all right? And so verse 6 helps us to see what the rift is. And when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brother, brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in the question. This was extremely smart, amen? This was extremely smart, because like I said, if he says, well, I'm a Christian, <clears throat> his case is over, right? They're just going to tear him up. But he knows that there's a division between Sadducees and Pharisees. We're going to see that in just a moment. And the greater part, the Pharisees believe in the resurrection. In fact, when you look at what the Pharisees believe, they are so close to being saved, it's unbelievable. But they come right up to Jesus, they're right at the edge of being a Christian, and then they deny Christ. But everything else about what they believe is biblical with the exception of the traditions that they add on and, and all those other things. But when you talk about biblical things, they believe in angels, they believe in the resurrection, uh, they believe that the Bible's the inspired word of God, they believe it from Genesis to Malachi. They believe all that, amen? The Sadducees don't. So Paul perceives, this is my end. I'm going to tell him I'm a Pharisee. Now, he's not lying. He was a Pharisee, and he was the son of a Pharisee. That's what he was, you know, before he got saved. And so he's going to use that for his advantage. It says, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead. I am called in question. 
Because that's what he did. He preached that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He resurrected. You said you believe in the resurrection? Well, here, Jesus rose from the dead. But with the Jewish mindset on all this, they believe in a final resurrection at the end, when everybody will be resurrected at, at one time. It's called a general resurrection. Don't have the time to get into all the theology behind that. But that's basically what Jews believed then or what Jews believe today. Verse number 7, And when he had said so, there arose a dissension. So you go, you take this rift, and you go into a reaction. Verses 7 and 8 are the reaction to what Paul said. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. This, <laughs> this works perfect for Paul. Now they got him fighting with each other, amen? Verse number 8, for the, the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, uh, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So the Sadducees don't even, the Pharisees are, are like today's atheists. When you die, you just become worm food. They don't believe this, the Bible is inspired of God. Uh, you know, they don't believe it. They don't believe in uh, angels and spirits. And, and they're the liberals of that day. Uh, unfortunately, they're the people with the power. They're, most of your wealth came through your Sadducees for whatever reason. Uh, but they had no true belief and trust. And so here, the, the, the Sadducees are like the liberals today, and the Pharisees are like the conservatives today. They, that, they would be, right? So if you're a conservative, you'd line up more with a Pharisee. And if you're a liberal, you'd want, want, uh, line up more with the Sadducee. All right, so you have the rift and the reaction, and then you have the riot. Verse number 9. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying. So strove, this is a strong argument. These guys are mad, man. They're just, their faces turning red, blood vessels are popping out of their neck. And they're saying whatever they want to say. I, I read this and I'm thinking, what in the world are the Roman soldiers thinking that brought this council together to meet? They must be thinking, these guys are barbaric. Look at this craziness that's going on. We just want to find out what this guy did to cause an uproar. And, well, I guess they're getting a first-hand example of what he did to cause an uproar because it's happening right in front of them. And so, uh, verse number 9, there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the, uh, the, yeah, the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, we find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now, the scribes, you've got to remember, uh, they probably knew the word of God, the Old Testament, better than anybody. Why was that? Because they were, they, they were constantly copying copies, copying copies of the Old Testament. In fact, people always talk about, you know, that stupid game, Telephone, where you get 10 people in a line, and by the time it, you, what you said gets down to the last person, it's completely different. And so people say, well, you can't trust the Word of God because of that. Better do your homework. You better go back and check it out before you start running your mouth. When a scribe was copying a scroll or a manuscript, if he come up and made one mistake, they destroyed the whole manuscript. He starts over. When he comes up to the name of God, he takes all his clothes off, washes, takes a bath, puts on new clothes, gets a new uh, quilt or whatever they use, a reed to write with, he gets a brand new one. I thought to myself, man, there's some verses where the word God or a variation of the word God comes up quite a bit in a few verses. They'd be taking 10 baths in one day. But this is how meticulous they were in copying the word of God. They would count each letter across the, the page, because they knew exactly how many letters it would take to go across the page. If there was one more or one less, they destroy it and start over again. This is how meticulous they were. This is why I believe in, in manuscript evidence, but not the manuscript evidence that comes off the corrupt Greek manuscript, which comes uh, through the Vatican, which is the Vaticanus manuscript, which is where all new versions come from. The King James Bible comes from the received text, completely different Greek text that was extremely 
uh, meticulously preserved by people who cared about the Word of God. And the Old Testament, you can't deny the Old Testament because they were so meticulous. So the Word of God has been preserved just like God said it would be. Amen? And, uh, and then, and of course, uh, with the New King James, you have a combination of some of the Metectus Receptus, probably the larger part of the New King James is from the Texas Receptus, but it also is uh, the majority text, which I don't have the time to get into this, but the majority text. And the majority text has problems in it also, and then it has areas where it goes off of uh, the Vaticanus manuscript. And it'll say it right in your footnotes. It'll say stuff like, uh, this verse is or is not found, this word's not found. Uh, by the best manuscript. And every time they say the best manuscript, they're talking about the manuscript from the Vatican, the Vaticanus. And it's not the best manuscript. So I don't have the time to be going into all that. But understand that the Word of God was preserved. And these Pharisees were dedicated to it. And so they say, we find no evil in this man. Well, right then and there, they should have said, case closed, Paul, you're a free man to go. But they don't. In fact, what's going to happen is Paul's going to be arrested and he's going to end up coming before some other people, but he'll spend two more years, two more years in Caesarea as a prisoner before he ever gets to Rome. Uh, so they say, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So in other words, you know, whatever Paul has to say, has this come from a spirit or an angel? Maybe it's God speaking. We don't want to fight against God. Now, that's not the attitude they had before, right? But now that they're at odds with the Sadducees, this is the attitude that they have. All right, so verse number uh, 10 tells us, the first part of verse number 10, And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. All right, now what has happened? We already said that there was a loud argument going on. That argument increased greater. And when there arose a great dissension, now you've got all kinds of fighting going on. Uh, the chief captain fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them. So what's happened? The Pharisee says, well, we don't find no evil in this man. And they're pulling him this way. Perhaps they're trying to line up with Paul. And the Sadducees are saying, yeah, he's an evil guy. He's wicked. He needs to be stoned to death. And they're pulling him this way. And so you got both the Pharisees and the Sadducees and who knows how many men are pulling on Paul back and forth. And then finally the captain, the Roman soldier, the captain of the, of the Roman soldier says, man, i got to send guys in there to get Paul out of there before they pull him to pieces. So they send uh, the Roman soldiers in there. They come in with their drawn swords and uh, people back off. And then they take Paul and they bring Paul back in custody and they take him to the council. So you have Paul's fiery spirit. You have Paul's strategy. And now in verse 11, you have Paul's future service. He's saved by the soldiers in verse number 10. We already read that. And he's strengthened by the Savior. In other words, God comes to him and he gives him words of comfort. And the night following, so it's the next day, he didn't come right away. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. So how's that comfort? He's not going to be put to death. He's not going to be killed, at least not yet. He's going to go to Rome. So even though he spends two more years in Caesarea, he knows he's not going to be put to death because God has already told him he was going to go to Rome. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this is the third time that the Lord has appeared to uh, Paul. And basically, he's appearing to him through vision. So it's not like he's physically standing before him. But let's take a quick look at those appearances. Look at Acts 18, Acts 18 and verse number 9. Acts 18 and verse number 9, notice there the Word of God says, Then spoke the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. So yes, the Lord appeared before Paul, but it wasn't a physical manifestation. It was a vision. Amen? Uh, 
This is important to know because you got people going around, you know, well, Kenneth Copeland, he said that the Lord stood at the foot of his bed. And he said, I never said I was God. They said I was God. Uh, that's wrong. That wasn't the Jesus of the Bible that stood at the foot of his bed because the Jesus of the Bible did say he was God. And so that was many years ago that Copeland did that. So I doubt seriously you'd be able to, I would hope that he wouldn't, he's learned his lesson and not going to say that ever again. Uh, but it questions when people start talking about this and that, that that's happened. Amen. So you need to use uh, discernment. Uh, then spake the Lord to Paul in night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. Amen. Now the Calvinists love this verse. See, he had much people in the city. No. God is God. God knows who's going to get saved and who's not going to get saved. He's telling Paul, Paul, you preach it because there's a bunch of people that are going to get saved because I have much people in this city, many people that are going to come to Christ through your preaching. And so Paul is comforted by the word here. And notice he says, I am with thee. Now, not, that doesn't mean that every time Paul, Paul looks to his left or his right, he sees Jesus. No, but he got Jesus' word here that I am with thee, Paul. Even though you don't see me, I am with you. All right, that's the first time. The second, well, actually, you could say the first time was probably on the road to Emmaus, or not Emmaus, uh, Damascus. Uh, the next uh, account of the Lord showing up to, uh, to Paul uh, is chapter 22 and verse 17. Chapter 22 and verse number 17. There the word of God says, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. So this trance is the same thing as a vision, amen? I was in a trance and saw him, that's the Lord, saying unto me, make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. All right, and, and then, of course, verse 21, the Lord also says to him, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. So there were times when the Lord said, Paul, you need to get out of town, you need to do it now, and you need to do it quickly. All right, so he appears to Paul, but it's by a vision. And then, of course, uh, in uh, Acts 23, and then verse number 11 is the third time recorded for us. And, then, and the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer. This is an incredible word. Be of good cheer. Be of courage. Be courageous. Be happy. Amen. Be of good cheer. And it's amazing how God wants us to, despite what we're facing, it don't matter what we're facing, he wants us to be of good cheer. And so he tells Paul, be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. The last verse I want to look at is the end of Paul's life in 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, because this is a lesson that Paul learned. In 2 Timothy in chapter 4, I want you to notice. And this is the lesson that we all need to learn. Now I'm going to back it up just to get the setting of the atmosphere that Paul is in and he's writing from. He says, uh, he, he says in verse number 9, uh, he's talking to Timothy. That's who he wrote this letter to, 2 Timothy. He says, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. So do the best you can to get here as quick as you can. Why? For, Deme for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent unto Ephesus. All right, so he says, bring Mark. He says, Luke is the only one with me. Bring Mark. And then I love, well, I love this because we're reading a personal letter. This was going on in somebody's life, in Paul's life, amen? And this is what he says in verse 13. The cloak that I left at Troash with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee. Bring me that cloak that I left there. This is a personal letter. This is just interesting. This is Paul asking for a cloak uh, uh, to be brought to him. And the books, but especially the parchments. I like Paul because I line up with Paul saying the books are probably just the writings, other writings of men that he read. Look in my church library, my library at home, I got all kinds of books that men have read. 
Paul read the, the writings of other men. Bring the books, but especially the parchments, and the parchments were the scriptures, amen? So bring me the books, but especially the scripture, amen? Especially the word of God. Now, he says in verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou aware of also. In other words, don't trust this guy Alexander. You just you keep your eye on him. For he hath greatly withstood our words. He withstood the, the message, the gospel message. Now, this is what you need to see and understand. Verse 16, at my first answer, no man stood with me. But all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Amen? And it wasn't that he could see them and was having these constant visions, but he come to the point in his life where no matter what, he believed that the Lord was with him. And for me, this is what I said. I said, man, God's with me. God is, well, I'm not going through any problem or situation alone. I'm not going through anything any different than anybody else has had to face in life. But the thing is, God is with me. Amen? I don't see him, but he is there. Amen? He is right with me. In fact, he lives in my heart, is what the Bible says. He dwells in my heart by faith. I mean, how can you get any closer than that? Amen? Think about this. Maybe this is a bad illustration for me to use. But those of you that are married, how many times have you grabbed, you grabbed your spouse and you hugged them so much with so much love, you, you wish that you could pull them inside of you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. This is what happened between us and God. Only with God, we were able to pull them inside of us. Amen. And he lives there even now. So notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known. And that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. And will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What a beautiful statement that Paul makes there. Of his future hope. Of future glory. But he knows that God is with him. Amen. And so in Acts 23. He's facing a horrible situation. People just want to kill him. They all hate him. But he's beginning to learn a lesson that God is with him. Amen? That God is with him. And it's a lesson that's going to endure him to the end. So no matter, no matter what we face in life, the Lord is always with us. Life lesson number one. No matter what we face in life, the Lord is always with us. Life lesson number two. The closer we walk with the Lord the easier it is to sense and feel his presence. I am serious about this because some people say, I don't know, I've never really felt the Lord. Well, I'll tell you from personal experience why you never felt the Lord. Because if I'm not walking close with the Lord, I'm not going to sense it. It's not that he left, he's still there. But I don't sense it because I'm distracted by everything else, Amen. But when I draw closer to the Lord in his, in walking with him, I sense his presence, amen. I sense his nearness. It is there. But if I want to feel that, I'm going to have to be walking with the Lord, amen. Does it make sense? Paul learned this. We can learn it too. And God has promised us in his word, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Though all men forsook me, the Lord stood with me. To everybody out here, to anybody listening on the airways, though all men forsake you, you might feel alone, you might feel abandoned, the Lord is with you, amen, and he will strengthen you. But you have to be saved. So if you're not a Christian and you're hearing my words, you need to get saved because this is a benefit only for those that know the Lord. Amen. If you're saved, you can say, praise God, God is with me and I can lean on him and he can strengthen me. But if you're lost, you're going to have to get saved. And I said, what in the world? What do you mean get saved? I mean, you need to realize that you're a sinner, that you deserve to die and go to hell. That's what you deserve. That's where you're headed. You've been headed that way since you were born. But Jesus Christ died on an old rugged cross for the specific purpose of paying your sin debt so you wouldn't have to go to hell. And once you realize that you deserve to go to hell, but you also realize that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin, 
you can embrace him. You can say, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. And at that moment, you'll be what the Bible says, born again. He'll come and live in you. Amen? And he'll be there to strengthen you. And you can get in on this thing of God always being with you, especially through the difficult time. Because if you're listening to me right now and you're lost and you don't know Christ as your Savior, everything you've tried to do to find comfort in the difficulties of life fails you. Yeah, you could go drink. I did that before I was saved. It didn't do anything for me. It was the emptiness and the same problems were still there. You can drink, drugs, smoke, whatever you want. But you know as well as I know there's an emptiness inside that stays there. And there's nothing that can fill it. You can work yourself to death trying to get enough money to be on top and to be the top dog. But the problem with that is that doesn't satisfy either. It just separates you and your family and the ones that you love. So when you're dying on your deathbed, you say, I wish I spent more time with my family, even though you're leaving a million dollars. Listen, the only thing that's going to satisfy is Jesus Christ. So whoever's listening to me out there, I really believe that the Lord has me saying this because somebody is listening to this. You need to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, not a religion, not a religious system, Jesus himself. God have mercy upon me. Forgive me of my sins based totally and only upon what Jesus has done on the cross. And the moment you place your full trust in the Christ, God says, you are saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so whoever's heard that and believes that God has spoken to them, I, I, I'd ask you to have enough courage to give us a call and let us know, amen? Let us know. Let us help you in what your next step would be as a new believer. Amen. Well, let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll have the invitation. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the Holy Word of God. And I just pray that even now, God, as your message went out over the airways, that it touched hearts and individuals and drew people closer to yourself, Father God. I pray, Father God, that you would be with all those that are saved, that we would take serious the promises of God, especially the promise that says, I am with thee, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Uh, so many times, God, we think we're lone rangers. We think we're going through this on our own. And the truth is, it doesn't matter how many people are in the room, you're a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You are right there with us, Lord, and you're ready to strengthen us. So, Father, I pray that you would strengthen all those that are struggling with things tonight. And there's a lot of things. We've got a lot of things on that prayer list, God, of things that people are struggling with. We pray for your healing hand. I pray, God, you raise up Brother Mays from this bed of affliction, heal him of that COVID completely, Lord, and guard Mrs. Mays from catching it, dear Lord. And we trust, God, that you'll protect everybody in our church from this COVID virus that is making its rounds again, that everybody here would be safe from it, Lord. We look for your protective hand uh, to keep it away. Father, we thank you for being our Lord and our Savior. And we thank you for the promise that you're coming again. You're coming again. And we pray, like the Apostle John at the end of the book of Revelation, even so, come, Lord Jesus. But until you come, may we occupy, and may we stay busy, and we may we keep our eyes looking up, knowing that our redemption draweth nigh. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. All right, Jeremy, if you want to come and lead us in that hymn.